Just a few weeks after the general elections, some sedition charges were dropped, and things seemed to be looking up in the Freedom of Speech Department. But then recently, this also happened. Someone filed a police report saying that my article is trying to incite people to go against the monarchy. So do we really have freedom of speech? Maybe not. Here's why. Freedom of speech is a universal right, literally. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights Article 19 states that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. In Malaysia, our federal constitution guarantees freedom of speech and expression too. But this freedom is not absolute. The constitution allows for the Malaysian parliament to enact laws that curtail freedom of expression for various reasons, including national security, public order, morality, the rights and privileges of Malays, and the position of the Malay rulers. That's why we have laws like the Special Offenses Act, the Prevention of Crime Act, the now repealed Internal Security Act, and the infamous Sedition Act. These laws do restrict freedom of expression in some way, but they are supported by the Constitution. The oldest of these laws is the Sedition Act 1948. The law basically makes it a crime to incite a rebellion against the government or the monarchy or to incite tensions between races, classes, and religions. When it was created, the Federation of Malaya, as the country was then known, was facing a growing communist insurgency. The law was enacted to allow authorities to act against communist rebels. Aside from communist rebels, charges were also directed at pro-Merdeka freedom fighters like Ahmad Bostaman and Samad Ismail. These guys have since been recognized in history books as national heroes. Former colonies and dominions of the British Empire would have uh, the Sedition Act at some point in time. Some of them have actually abolished their Sedition Act. We are one of the few countries um, which still have the Sedition Act. So the idea was to stop people from rising up against their masters, their colonial masters, so that you know, people, the populace, uh, is kept uh, in place. After Merdeka, the government followed that lead and used the law mostly to stifle its political opponents. According to experts, this was especially pronounced during the 70s and 80s. Even in the last 20, 30 years, the charges were completely politically motivated because there's, there's no reason why, why the government should have picked on those people. The grounds for arresting and detaining you is so vague. The term seditious or seditious tendency, how, how do you argue with that? And so that's why it's used because it's convenient for the ruling party. There are of course a small number of cases where it was used because they feel that they actually threaten the fabric of society or the harmony between the races and so on and so forth. But most of the time when you see it being used, uh, it's for a political purpose. Fast forward to 2012. Kerajaan telah membuat keputusan agar Akta Hasutan 1948 dimasukkan menjamin kebebasan bersuara setiap warga negara selaras dengan peruntukan dan jaminan yang terkandung dalam perlembagaan persekutuan di negara ini. But instead of repealing the law, the government amended it. Sebagai Perdana Menteri, memutuskan bahawa Akta Hasutan 1948 akan terus dikekalkan supaya kita benar-benar dapat mewujudkan negara Malaysia yang lebih aman dan lebih stabil dan lebih harmoni. The law now covers electronic content, not just print, spoken word and physical acts. The amendment also removed the option for bail, allowed for stiffer penalties, and introduced mandatory sentencing. That means, if convicted, there are certain crimes you can't just pay a fine for. You have to go to jail. Some of these laws that, that, that allow mandatory sentencing is very backward because you're not giving the judge the, the leeway to sentence. So any kind of law that gives a mandatory sentence is, is, is backward. But there were some welcome amendments. Clauses related to the government and the judiciary were removed. That means that it should be legally impossible to charge critics of the government and judiciary for sedition. Except, this is not really true in practice. In 2016, the year after the amendments came into force, 10 out of 15 cases were investigated specifically for campaigning against or criticizing the government. 
In 2017, there were only nine sedition cases, but still there was one case targeting an opposition party member for criticizing political parties in the ruling government. This downward trend in the number of cases might seem like good news, but at the same time, there was a huge upsurge in cases charged under Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act 1998. Looking at the studies by Swaram, the vast majority of the cases under the CMA 98 were essentially seditious offenses. Reports by international human rights groups agree with this, with one group in particular saying that the CMA has overtaken the Sedition Act as the biggest legal threat to freedom of expression. After the 2015 amendments, only one institution continued to be protected under the Sedition Act, the monarchy. Here's why. The role of the monarch, or more specifically the rulers, in a constitutional monarchy really depends on um, what is stated in the constitution itself. Their roles, their functions, their powers is derived from the constitution because of the role that they play as um, head of state you need a certain sense of uh, continuity. For example, there is a change of government. Uh, you need to have at least one institution which remains constant, and that is the institution of the Yang Tuan Agong. So governments may change, but the Yang Tuan Agong, as the constitutional monarch, remain the same, and it is above politics. It gives at least a symbol of the state itself. Constitutional monarchies are supposed to be apolitical, uh, they're not supposed to wade into uh, political issues, especially partisan politics, because of the fact that they are uh, constitutional monarchs. But in reality, members of the monarchy are not always apolitical. Royals have spoken up against specific politicians and political parties in the past, even in the run-up to the recent general elections. All of this was widely reported in the media. There is also the matter of members of the monarchy being heavily involved in commercial ventures. In this country, it's very clear that a lot of uh, rulers have taken part in uh, investments in this country. They have lots of invested interests. Public reports and records show members of the monarchy having stakes in large businesses across many industries, including property development, healthcare, mining, and hotels. A quick Google search will lead you to the public records of these business interests. When the rulers uh, partake in, uh, in investments, it's bound to lead to conflict of interest of sorts, you know. It is worth noting that the constitution only prohibits the Yang Di Pertuan Agong from having any commercial interest. Laws appear to be silent on whether state monarchies are allowed. Ideally, the sedition laws are meant to protect the institution of the monarchy as they serve an important function in our democracy. But if there were to be conflicts of interest, that function might be compromised. Technically, the Sedition Act allows us or any other citizen to point out the mistakes of the monarchy and the government. It exempts such criticism from being considered seditious. That's important. The government should not be afraid of, of criticism. I, as a parent, is not afraid of being criticized by my, my children if I, if I do anything that crosses the line. You know, it's good for their, their development and it's good for, their, for them to voice their views about any part of our society. This is what a, a mature society is about. This is what a society at peace with itself is all about. I think freedom of speech is, is vital. You know, it's like seen to be the kind of the cornerstone of a democracy. So now you know. In the Malaysian democracy, you can and should speak up against institutions if you think something's not right. But having the freedom of expression also means being open to different views. After all, the path to democracy is a two-way street.